If you are able, you can take off your shoes because we are standing on holy ground. How did we get here to this place where Moses has the ones who said they were on God's side walk through the camp and slaughter a brother, a friend, and a neighbor? How did we get to this place where God sends a plague upon his people? So let's start at the beginning. You remember the story how it begins with Moses being put in a basket and floated down a river and rescued. You remember how the story then is that Moses learns that he is one of the enslaved people and sees how they are being mistreated and killed. And so he kills one of those who has mistreated the people he belongs to. And then he flees into the desert where he creates a new life. A life with family, with children. And yet one day, he has a revelation upon the mountain. Where he experiences the presence of God, hears the word of God, and is called on a mission where he's invited to put his sandals back on and go and free his people. And he does that. He wanders into Egypt, confronts the family he grew up with, the only family he knows, and tells them to let his people go. It doesn't work out very easily. You all remember those images from the Ten Commandments, right? Plague upon plague upon plague upon plague, until Pharaoh says they can go. And then Pharaoh, chases them after he's freed them, but the people escape because God parts the dangerous waters. And for seven weeks, they've been in the wilderness, and on that journey, you know what has happened. Each week, they've encountered another problem, and they have said, how could you bring us here? How could you lead us out of Egypt? We're starving, we're hungry, we have no water. But each time, each time, Moses and God find a way through the problem. And now, here, they're at the base of that same mountain. They're there at the base of the mountain, and they have just experienced, remember we heard this story, of God. They have seen God in the smoky clouds and heard God's voice in the thunderous thunder. They have agreed that they will follow the rules that God has laid out. And so Moses stays there on the top of the mountain and he learned about the Ten Commandments, right? Well, here's the thing. We left Moses last week in chapter 20, okay? We're now at chapter 32. Between 20 and 32 are a whole lot more commandments than the 10 that we talked about. In between those 10 commandments, God lays out a dream and a vision of what it means to be God's people. Talks about caring for our neighbors. Lays out what it will look like to be under the protection of God, and lays out how we, as a people, can worship God, what the church will look like, what the altar will look like, what the oil will look like, and the candles, lays out what the priests will wear, and how they will wear it, and how they will enter. Everything is laid out, and Moses has been up there for weeks, hearing all of this from God, writing it down, writing it in his heart so that Moses can take those rules to God's people. But down on the ground, down on the ground, the people are uncomfortable because it's not easy to be free from slavery. It's not easy to 
let go of the past. Let go of what you used to know, how you used to be. It's not easy. And so the people, the people demand from Aaron a new God. Because the old God, the God who freed them from Israel, who is the new God, is scary. The new God has the power to send plagues. The old gods, the ones that look like this calf, the old gods you danced and partied and gave offerings to. But they didn't actually appear in your presence and thunder before you. They didn't actually move into your life in the way that God has. And the people want that old, comfortable feeling, that old feeling of nostalgia that puts them back in a place of safety. And so they demand from Aaron that he create a God for them to worship. And Moses and God are still talking about how this people should be organized when God realizes what the people at the foot of the mountain are doing. And God says, I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses pleads the case of the people, saying to save them. How could you have freed them from slavery and now want their destruction? And God relents. And Moses heads down the mountain. This is where the tablets are now, okay? So he finally has the tablets in his arms. Heading down the mountain, gets to the base of the mountain and sees them dancing around the calf. He didn't know what God knew. He just knew that God was upset. Now he sees what God sees. The tablets fall and break. And Moses calls to him any who are faithful to God. And all of Levi's sons come to stand with him. And Moses tells Levi's sons to go from gate to gate, from one side of the camp to the other, kill a brother, a friend, and a neighbor. because his anger had been kindled. And I don't know how I feel about Moses and God at this point, I'll be honest with you. I, it makes me squirmy. And then, after Moses has wreaked his punishment upon the people, he takes that calf, melts it down, puts it in the water that he then makes them all drink. So now that God that they used to have is now inside. And he goes back up to talk to God. And God says, I'm going to destroy them. I know I promised you not, but this is wrong, what has happened. And so Moses again pleads for his people. He says, you can remove my name from the book of life. I will take the punishment for these people. And God relents and promises only a plague that he puts on the people. This is a hard story, right? How do we deal with a story of people who have experienced the real presence have felt God in their midst and have now turned their back on God? How do they deal with the consequences of their actions? And I, as I said, don't know how I feel about Moses or God in this story. Because it's a very unkind God. 
It's God angry in the way that God promised never to be angry again with Noah, right? God promised never to destroy the earth. And yet God is so angry at his people, he's ready to wipe them out. How do we deal with a situation that is so problematic? Where the consequences of the action are so dire? That's part of the reason why we're talking about this today with the pictures of Glacier National Park. In these images that are happening right now, the first image is from sometime in the early part of the 1900s. So 1911, 1913, 1918. The second image is from within 10 years of now. I don't know why they don't have the current ones, but they didn't have the current pictures. They show the exact same spot from the exact same place the picture was taken. And what we see in Glacier National Park is that in the early 1900s, when they first cataloged how many glaciers there were in the park, they counted 150. Now, today, there are 25. And by 2030, but I think it will be increasing exponentially, there will be no glaciers in Glacier National that should make us deeply sad. It should make us think about the consequences of our actions collectively. About how we change the world that we are given. Because Glacier has been telling us for 30, 40 years that climate change is real and that climate change is accelerating rapidly. But the pictures that they are taking there that show you back and forth between the old and new, they used to take those pictures every other year. Now they have moved to taking them all the time because the glaciers are disappearing before our eyes. And it's a consequence of the choices we have made as people. That we, not us individually, but we nations, have decided to live beyond what our earth can sustain. Tomorrow, there is a report coming out from a, a organization that has been charged to look at how climate change is affecting the earth right this moment. And how many of you can tell me what is happening today in Greece, in Turkey, in the western the United States? How many of you have seen apocalyptic images this last week of people fleeing fire? We know that our actions have definite, real consequences. And those consequences are deadly. So how do we deal with it? When I was researching this passage of scripture, one of the people I love to turn to about Old Testament passages, about the Torah, is Rabbi Daniel Rettenberg. And in talking about this passage, and the consequences of our actions, she asked, how will, how we know that people will die if we don't take precautions? She's talking about COVID, but it could be about climate change. We need leadership that is brave and bold and that holds the pain and fear that people are feeling. In other words, we need a leader like Moses and not a leader like Aaron. Because when Aaron was faced with a difficult decision about how to move forward in life, he chose to build an idol, 
to ignore the God that is thundering on the mountain. Right now, you can see it. You can experience the presence of the God. He chose to ignore God and build an idol. Whereas Moses knew that things were going to be hard and difficult and challenging and took on the challenge anyway. Knew that new things were needed and decided to act anyway. We need leadership like that now. We need leadership that is brave and bold and that holds our pain and our fear and helps us to imagine a better world that is new, that is not clinging to a past that never was and never will be again. We need a space to feel our pain and fear and hope about the unknown. To hope, to believe that we can change Glacier National Park so it doesn't have to lose its name. That we can change so that we, especially my grandchildren who don't even exist yet, have an earth to live on. That's why I loved her question. They don't give you an answer, but they ask you to think farther. How can we hold this space of unknowns? What do we need to do to let go of who we have been so that we can become who we are still yet to be? Now, I love that question, and here is why. Because that's a play on God's name. I am who I am is how we normally translate it, but it is also known as a verb that is, I am who I will be. That that's the space we have to hold open for each other. That in the face of climate change, I can take this beautiful space and kill all those animals because the plants will no longer be able to survive because there will no longer be water to fill the lakes. We're seeing that already in California. We can imagine a world and create a world where the revelation of God shows us how to live into tomorrow. Even if we don't know the answer now, even if some answers can't be known, we can use this time to envision what is possible, what can be, and we can take those little steps, those steps that we can do now ourselves to make a future possible where Glacier National Park still has glaciers. Amen. Um,